we have a generation, I always think it's kind of humorous, think about it, if you've got kids in school, they have a cell phone, they're told to turn it off, maybe, they, maybe your high school kids now have an iPhone or something. So we tell our students to turn off all their technology while we go in and, and most schools still teach them with a textbook. But as soon as they get out of class, they plug back in and begin Googling and doing research or communicating with people all around the world many times to find, uh, do research for the homework that they were given, homework assignments they were given while in school. Education is going to change. It's just slow to get there. We have computers. That was a big deal to be able to have computers in every classroom or computers for every student. Now you have schools that are talking about laptops to be able to sit home with their students. Not just in college, we're talking high school and lower. We have, we have schools that are doing pilot projects of no textbooks. I think that's where we're moving. That is all part of this future generation that is going to begin to fill our jobs before long, and they're going to expect certain technology to be in place, certain processes to be in place, so that they do not feel like that they have gone backwards to the dinosaur age when it is their turn to step into our roles. So it does have an economic impact, and it can be a significant opportunity for the state of Oklahoma. From 1995 to 2002, I served on a board of regents for a tiny uh, a small two-year private women's college in Missouri. And at that point in time, this small town, it was about 60 miles north of uh, Joplin, this small community uh, was on US 70, I think, whatever came, came from Texas City down to Joplin. And I would listen to the people in that town talk about how fortunate they were to be right there. Now, you remember, this is 15 years ago, some of that discussion's going on. But there was discussion at that time that if they could lay fiber optic from Joplin to St. Louis, from St. Louis to Kansas City, and Kansas City down to Joplin, they would create a triangle that would create um, a synergy for development that meant you could have companies living in, along those areas, people living along those areas <coughs> that work around the world. And the little community where the college was that I worked with started building cottages, started trying to build what would, I would now call a Wi-Fi community, but started trying to build a community that they could recruit individual entrepreneurs to come, trying to guarantee them that they would have access to the technology that would let them reach around the world um, to be able to sell their goods or programs or whatever it was they were doing. I didn't hear that kind of conversation in Oklahoma until recently. Now technology's improved, but that kind of idea making, that kind of foresight, that kind of vision is what we in the state have an opportunity to do. And when times are tough, as our economy is right now, it is our time to try to think down the road about what we want Oklahoma to look like, not tomorrow, not four years from now, but 10, 15, and 20 years from now. So when we're making budget decisions at the state capitol, we need to be making sure that while we are, that we don't erode the infrastructure, but that we build an infrastructure. And that's more than just roads and bridges. It is the technology infrastructure that you guys navigate way better than I do. But I, know, I navigated enough to know it is essential if Oklahoma wants to compete, not with other, other states, but if we want to compete with keeping our kids here, when they grow up and have an opportunity to find jobs of their own so that we can compete globally. We have to do that. We have to make that investment. And so what I would say to you is that I, I started thinking, because I, I have been involved in, since, since I was elected Lieutenant Governor, with the Oklahoma Creativity Project. And it has a lot of ideas and understands that creativity is about more than arts and music in our schools, but it is about that as well. It's about other things that can be done. It's about the entrepreneurs that create new kind of prosthetics um, that are available, and, and it's about new kinds of uh, ways of doing engineering and, and lots of different things. And I thought about how creativity has brought us every major advancement that we've had in our world and certainly in our country. And think about it. Creativity helped create a box called a television. Creativity helped create a box called a telephone. 
Creativity helped create a box called a desktop computer. Creativity helped create a box called a cell phone or an iPhone or a smartphone or whatever your communication device is right now. But what you all have the opportunity to do is to take creativity outside the box. And that's what we need in government. We need that kind of creativity that goes outside the box. And in fact, I would say, to the extent that you help recognize that there is no box. There is no box. There is no limit to what we can do. There's no limit to how we should think. There's no limit to what we can envision if the right people help us put it together in the right way. So I hope that that's what Gov 2.0 will do for us. And I look forward to being able to be your partner and help you implement the great ideas that you all bring to us. Thank you all very much for the chance to be here today. We also have an obligation to the future generation to make sure that we put into place that kind of infrastructure that will allow them, first of all, to be educated in the systems of today and tomorrow and the next decades down the road. And then we have an obligation to help make sure that when they are adults that we have kept pace with them and that we have that infrastructure and that technology ready for them to move ahead.